understanding logic is a skill, right? And any skill can, any skill can be learned. Hey everyone, this is Yvette Hampton. Welcome back to the Schoolhouse Rocked podcast. I'm back today with my friend, Kathy, and we are having such a good conversation about logic and critical thinking and propaganda and all the things that swirl around our brains and our kids' faces and heads all the time, everywhere we go. And it is so important to teach our kids and to know ourselves how to recognize fallacy in thinking, how to recognize how the world is trying to influence us. And we have an enemy, there's an enemy of our soul that is out to get us and out to get our kids. And, you know, we know the Bible says that Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy, and he's doing everything he can to destroy the hearts and souls of your kids and yours as well. And so we've got to be ready for battle, just like in Ephesians, you know, it talks about putting on the full arm, armor of God. This is one of the ways that we do this with ourselves and with our kids. We put our armor on first which of course is through the word of God, but we have to be ready for this war. And then we've got to put this armor on our kids and prepare them for this battle that they're in. And so this is such an important topic. And I I hope that it's been as much of a blessing to you guys as it has been to me this week. I'm really enjoying talking with Kathy. But before we get back in, I want to thank our sponsor, CTC Math ctcmath.com. Go there if you guys are looking for a great online math program, ctcmath.com. You can try them out for free. Kathy, okay, this is um, such a good conversation. And for those listening, if you missed Monday and Wednesday's episodes, go back and listen to those because those are really important to leading up to what we're going to talk about today. Um, But I I, I have a simple question to start off, and then I want to get into some stuff that's just a little bit deeper. But sure. um, Can, can anyone learn to be a good thinker? And that might sound like a dumb question. Um, but is, is, I don't know when I think about logic, I think about people who go to, you know, really prestigious schools (laughs) and who are kind of the elbows. Right, Right, exactly. Exactly. Where there's sweaters around their necks, you know, (laughs) I mean, they time around their necks. Yes. Yes. (laughs) Um, and you don't usually think of the simple minded people and truly for the most part, I'm a fairly simple minded person. I really am. Um, and so I, I look at this sometimes I'm like, man, I I'm learning still how to think logically, like we've talked about before. Um, but is this something that just anybody can learn to do? And if so, how? Yes. A hundred percent. Yes. So understanding logic is a skill right? And any skill can, any skill can be learned. And there might be some people who they are more naturally oriented this way, right? Maybe, maybe some who are not as naturally oriented this way, but it doesn't matter. Everybody can learn their colors. They can learn to recognize colors. You can learn to recognize good thinking and bad thinking. And not only do I believe that we can, I think we have to, you know, the Bible tells us it is the glory of God to conceal a matter. And it's the glory of Kings to search a matter out. Mm. Right. It's one of the things he created us to do is to, is to search, is to look deeply, is to think well and think rightly about things. And so I feel like it's really important um, to do that. So I believe it is absolutely for everybody. I believe we need to have this skill. I'm so thankful. It took me until I was in my forties to learn it, but I'm so (laughs) thankful that I did. And I think, let me just share this with you. I've got a little list of why I believe good thinking skills are so important and why they are for everybody and why we need to learn them and and why I think it can help to change the world. So I'm going to go through it real quick. There's 11 of them. Okay. And why I think everybody needs them. Okay. Number one, things got very, very clear for me once I had the language and once I had the skills of good thinking, right? Mm -hmm. Things that before were like, well, yeah, I can kind of see that, but I can kind of think, you know, think that a little bit. And it's just kind of muddy in your brain about what you think or what is the right answer that goes away. It gets very clear once you know how to think well about things. Number two, Once you learn to reason well, you will never be mentally or emotionally manipulated again by advertisements, Mm. by politicians, by billboards, by commercials, by messaging, none of those. All those people, the reason they're doing that is because they stand to gain from your lack of critical thinking. Right. Period. There's some, there's some benefit that they get if 
you don't recognize bad thinking. Yeah. Number three, society will be better if more people um, are able to think and are able to reason well. Number four, we are not taught these in school. Like we, right, we've talked about this. We're not taught these in school. And so therefore it is on us. We have to learn them. We have to learn them. We have to learn them somewhere Mm -hmm. and we need to give them to our kids. Number five, being able to spot bad reasoning and flawed logic is (laughs) almost like having a superpower because Uh, most other people can't do it. And it's one of the simplest superpowers that we can give to our kids because kids pick it up super fast. And once it's like they, it's like their brain gets switched on to being able to uh, look at things logically and they don't ever lose that again. They'll, they'll always have it with them. Number six, you will not get fooled by foolishness. And Mm. as you've said, there is no shortage of people out there trying to tell us what they, what they want us to think. And half of it is foolishness. But when you can think, well, you won't get fooled by it anymore. Number seven, you will be more persuasive when you're talking about things that you care about, or when you're sharing the truth and you will not have to be the one resorting to manipulation or Mm -hmm. or resorting to bad logic. And in this day, we are supposed to always be ready to give uh, um, an answer for the hope that we have in us. Well, we should be able to do that. Well, we should be able to do that in a winsome way. We should be able to do that in a clear way. And good thinking helps us to be able to do that because Here's the thing. Bad thinking isn't limited to one political party and not the other. Bad right. thinking isn't limited to, you know, one group of educated people and not this other or one, you know, religious organization. Everybody is prone to it. We're all prone to right. it. And so if we want to present our ideas and our thoughts in a way that people can accept them and understand them, it helps to have this foundation. Um, number eight, good thinking improves your mental and your emotional health, which right now, as we know, mental and emotional health, we are having an epidemic in it after these last yeah. couple of years with all the shutdowns and the fear and all that, that we've been just hammered with. Well, again, you are not going to be as susceptible to that if you can recognize it and you know how to think well. And it just, when you have clarity, you are not tossed by the waves of right. the emotionalism and by the messaging and by the fear. And it makes you healthier just in a lot of different ways. Yeah. Number nine, good thinking improves your relationships because when you are able to have a good communication based on clarity without all the bad thinking, it makes for better relationships with the people that you love. Okay. Number 10, it makes you impervious to being used because again, there's always somebody out there who is trying to use you for their agenda. And when you can recognize it, you, you, yeah, you don't get used the way that other people will. Right. And then lastly, number 11, it's just, it's fun. Like it is just, it's a fun subject to learn. It's a fun subject to talk about with your kids and yeah, it's fun to be able to think well. Yeah. Love it. Let's take a break. We'll be right back. What we do at IEW is break through the the noise of the grammar and the writing prompts and we say, this is what you do, step by step. And I've witnessed it over and over again, both watching Andrew teach and hearing from parents, this is the best writing program. We've made it so easy and made it really affordable. So any mom can teach writing to their children using our course and we guarantee it. To try three weeks of free lessons, visit IEW.com. We are back with Kathy. Uh, We have a few minutes left. And in these last few minutes, I want to talk about something that I know that you have um, made a connection with, and you've made this connection between critical thinking and apologetics. Talk about that for a minute. Yeah, this was one of the things, honestly, that kind of surprised me. I didn't know that I was going to see this connection when I started uh, doing this, when I started really diving into critical thinking and uh, the fallacies. But what I started to see is the connection. I feel like critical thinking is foundational to being able to defend our faith, to apologetics. Mm -hmm. And, you know, apologetics is just a fancy word for being able to give a reason for the hope that we have within us, right? It's, It's being able to defend our faith and knowing the answers to why do we believe the things that we believe. And 
critical thinking, what what I started to realize is, oh my goodness, so many of the arguments that are made against our faith or against God or against the Bible, they're bad thinking, they're logical fallacies. Mm -hmm. But if you can't recognize them, then you're, you're going to be fooled by them. Because again, if you don't have good thinking, you're going to veer toward, uh, you're going to make one of these logical fallacies. You're going to, um, you're going to confuse things. I'll, I'll give you an example. There is a, <laughs> a meme that was going around a couple months ago and it was, con- it was saying, um, and I wish I had, I don't have it pulled up in front of me, but you'll get the gist of it. But it was saying, well, this is biblical, but it's not Christ-like. And this is biblical. Like it would say, um, you know, polygamy is biblical, but it's right. not Christ-like, right? All these things. Right, right, right. Um, yeah. And what they were doing, they were trying to say, okay, so these things are in the Bible, but that's right. not, but that's not Christ-like, calling into question the authority of the Bible. And I, I saw this meme and I was like, oh my gosh, here you go. This is an example, right? And I showed it to my daughter. She had a friend over. I showed it to them. Uh, both of them have been studying logic now at this point for three years, right? I'm like, uh-huh. okay, real world test. And I showed it to him. I said, what do you guys see? You know, tell me, tell me what you see with this. And it, it's an example of equivocation. They're using biblical and Christ-like Mm-hmm. Not in the way that those two words are originally meant. So they're using biblical to say it's in the Bible, right? right. On one example, right? Because there's a lot of things that are in the Bible, like there's sure. theft in the Bible, like Murder, it addresses, and all, it addresses a lot of <laughs> stuff. homosexuality, right? It's yeah. all in there, but that doesn't mean that God is endorsing it. That doesn't mean that right. God is saying this is how you should therefore live, right? Those are right. the things. But if you don't recognize it, it can take you down this whole path of strange theology and of strange ways of believing what you believe about the Bible and what you believe about God and to be true and to be not true. And so I just realized, here's another one, uh, reification. So reification is a fallacy that says that, that makes something inanimate as if it were like human, like it gives human like qualities Mm -hmm. to something inanimate. So an example that we have seen a lot is, well, the science says fill in the blank. Right. Yep. No, the science doesn't say. The science doesn't say anything. (laughs) The scientist will interpret it and say it a certain way. Right. And so they'll have, well, science says, and they'll come up with something that is not in agreement with the Bible. And so we're supposed to say, well, call into question the Bible because the science says, okay, well, number one, they're making a logical fallacy with that because the science isn't saying anything. This scientist is interpreting this data to say a certain thing. And so now I have to ask the question, what cognitive biases does that scientist have? What is his worldview? Where is he coming from? So you can see how these things all fit together. They all fit together to be able to recognize what mm-hmm. is the error in logic or the error in thinking that's being made here? And then go take it a step further. What are the cognitive biases that this person has? Right. And so I feel like if you have a good foundation in logical thinking, it makes the study of apologetics so much easier and so yeah. much more applicable because right. now you're recognizing them in the moment. It, it, it reduces it from a whole bunch of um, big sounding theology, right, into something that you can use on a daily basis, as you're yeah. having a conversation or you're scrolling through social media. So I feel yeah. like it's a really important foundation for that. Yeah. Yeah. And for those who may not know what apologetics is, it's not apologizing for anything. No. It is being able to defend your faith. It's that simple. It's it's knowing what you believe and why you believe it and being able to defend that to people who don't believe um, possibly or are questioning, you know, yeah. what God's word says about things. Um, so, okay. You just referred to social media and I, and I want to just end, um, on this note, with this question, um, you know, we, I, again, we talked earlier about how our, our kids are just living in a world that is, is trying to propagandize them in every way and trying to sway them to believe something that is not true, you know, most of the time. And they're just, they're truly bombarded with this on a daily basis, whether they're on social media or not, but especially if they do have social media, it's everywhere. How, how can we help our kids to develop 
media discernment. I mean, obviously, like we're, you know, we've been talking about teaching them to recognize fallacies, but how do we teach them to be discerning with yeah. what they're, they're seeing all around them? It's such a good question. One of the things that my dad did when we were growing up that used to drive me nuts when I was a kid, right? When I was a teenager. Um, but now as an adult, I look back and I have so much appreciation. I understand now what he was doing is he used to narrate life, right? So we could mm. be, um, driving down the road. And if we would see something, he would talk about it, about his thoughts on that thing and what, you know, what he was seeing. If there was something we were listening to on the radio, he used to do it during movies, which would drive us yeah. nuts <laughs> because we'd be watching a movie and somebody would say something and he would comment on it. He would comment on, well, that's ridiculous because this, or, oh, they're just doing this because, right. And so he right. was always just kind of narrating life for us, which used to drive us nuts. But now I realize what he was doing because on just on a daily basis in our everyday life, he was teaching us how to have discernment. He was teaching us how mm. to take the things that we were yep. seeing and think about it. And, and he didn't use any of this. He didn't even use equivocation or ad hominem. Like he didn't have any of this formal yeah, right. logic <laughs> training either, but he was just constantly using the things that were around us as mm -hmm. teaching moments. And he didn't say, I'm going to yeah. teach you a lesson. He just would say it. He just would say right. it, right? And I thought that that was genius. I, not at the time. Now I do. Now that I have my right. own <laughs> child, my own teenager, I think that's genius. And so I think one of the first things that we can do is we just have to be aware to mm -hmm. take the things that we're seeing on the daily basis and talk about them with our kids. Another thing that yeah. I do is I intentionally seek out things. Um, like if I'm on social media and I, like I said, with the meme, when I see things, I will show my daughter and I won't lead her. Yeah. I mean, she kind of knows what's coming now, right? Because we've done it enough, but I'll, um, but I'm very intentional about bringing material to her for her to digest. Mm -hmm. And she's not on social media yet. Right. So she's not getting the same things that I'm, that I'm seeing. Right. Right. And I don't want her to, but I'm preparing her. So like that, that right. graphic that I saw, well, this is biblical, but it's not Christ-like. Right. And so I said, what do you think? And I made her think, and they came yeah. back with one answer and their first answer was right. But I said, okay, that's awesome. And what else? Right. And so I'm yeah. making her think and having these conversations about the things mm -hmm. that they're seeing. If we don't do it now while they're in our house, who's going to do it? right? If we're right. not intentional yeah. about doing it. Another example is um, finding two different news articles, three different news articles on the same topic and saying, okay, mm -hmm. let's read these. Yeah. Let's read these three different news articles. And now let's have yeah. a conversation about it. Let's talk about, um, right. is this a fact piece or an opinion piece? Do they mm -hmm. know how to tell the difference between fact or opinion? Uh, what is the worldview yeah. of the person who wrote this? Does this person have any cognitive biases? What would they, what might they be? Um, are there any fallacies being used in this article? Uh, what does God's word say? Is this truth? Can you think of anything else that this might compare to or that you've heard of before? Right. And just finding material intentionally and having these conversations, um, and helping them realize there is a difference between emotionalism and relativism and truth. And there is a truth and we can yeah. know it. And maybe you'd ask them, how would you, what, how would you respond to this? If you saw this, how would you answer yeah. this? All of those things um, are really vital. And I feel like if we're not intentional about doing those and seeking mm -hmm. out those, and by the way, let me just say this, I've got a teenager. These are not like 45 minute conversations. Okay. <laughs> right. We're talking, yeah, yeah, yeah. If, we, if it's three to five minutes talking about it, I'm happy. That's good. That's enough. They're getting yeah. it right. They're getting, it. I don't want to set this big expectation that people think, Oh, you're having these big drawn out deep conversations. Not, right. not all the time. No, <laughs> not all the time. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that you talk about intentionality with it too, because we do have to be intentional in raising our yes. kids. It is hard work, but we have them for such a short amount of time and we have such a privilege uh, we, of being able to be with them and be the ones who are training their hearts. And this is part of it. This is part of training their hearts and pointing them towards yes. Jesus, but we have to be intentional about it. It is not going to just happen 
on its own. So, um, Kathy, thank you so much. This has been such a great conversation this week. I've been so um, encouraged and really had my eyes opened to so many different things. And um, I really do appreciate you sharing with us this week. You guys can find out all things Kathy Gibbons by going to the show notes. Um, Check out her podcast. It's called Filter It Through a Brain Cell. You can find her on Instagram. You can find her on her website. And, um, And again, the book that Uh, we've referred to several times is called the fallacy detective. Um, Here's the book. If you're watching on video, we'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. You guys, thank you for listening. We are so thankful for you. Thank you, Kathy, for being with us this week. It has been a lot of fun. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. And I will just say this. I am working on creating a resource for families to make it easy to find sources in uh, social media to have these conversations with your kids including giving you the questions to ask, like making it really easy. So um, it's not created yet, but I'm working on it. If you are interested, go to my website, filter it through braincell.com, get on the email list and you'll be the first to know when it's available. Love it. Thank you for for taking the time to put that together. I really appreciate that. Yeah. And thank you guys for listening. I hope you're having a great week. And um, if you guys are not signed up for our newsletter as well, go to schoolhouserocked.com, sign up for the newsletter. Please leave a review for this podcast so that others can find it and be encouraged like you have been. Have a great rest of your week. We'll see you back here on Monday. Bye. You don't just lose a generation of children. You know, we're talking about the millennials as if they just decided to up and leave. You lose a generation of grandparents and you lose a generation of parents and then you lose a generation of children. And that's really what's happened in our culture is that we had generations of kids from the church who started to doubt God's word and that doubt leads to unbelief. And a lot of them are walking away from the church. Two thirds of young people have walked away from the church by the time they reach college age, very few returning. Uh, The younger generation that are in our churches, uh, the millennials in our churches, uh, 40% say they're not born again, 65% say if you're a good person you'll go to heaven, and they're so secularized in their thinking. It it really comes down to the fact that most of them went to a public school uh, where uh, they haven't been taught how to defend the Christian faith, and at home we're not giving them the answers, and at churches we're not giving them the answers, so many of them drift away from the Christian faith. We need to empower our children with answers. If we believe in Judeo-Christian values and ethics, we need to be bringing that into the culture, not removing it from the culture, right? And so we need to empower our children to be able to argue on behalf of their beliefs.